بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا مظلوم يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقالت اليهود ليست النصارى على شيء وقالت النصارى ليست اليهود على شيء وهم يتلون الكتاب كذلك قال الذين لا يعلمون كذلك قال الذين لا يعلمون مثل قولهم فالله يحكم بينهم يوم القيامة فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون عطروا أفاهكم لذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد A second for the love of Imams al Hassan wal Hussein. A third for the love of Fatima al Zahra with your loudest voices. One of the major problems that our Ummah has been diagnosed with and has been enduring from the demise of Rasulullah up till our time. But especially during these days and the past several decades is the problem of takfir. The problem of labeling Muslims who believe in the shahadatain and who proclaim that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Proclaiming them as kuffar, as mushrikeen, as heretics, 
I was outside of the nation of Islam. This is a problem. We saw the results of the Tikfiri mentality. We saw the hundreds of thousands of victims of this mentality. It doesn't stop at calling others as kuffar or mushrikeen. No. When you call someone as a kafir and a mushrik, you are basically saying that their blood is halal, their money is halal, their wealth is halal, and you could do whatever you want to them. Haven't we suffered enough of this mentality in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan? These takfiri groups, isn't it enough the damage that they have caused to the Islamic nation? Of course, takfir is not condemnation of one another. It's not restricted to Islam. It exists in, in every religion. Karen Armstrong, in her book, The Fight for God, she discusses that in every religion there was an extremist group. In Judaism, there were extremists. In Christianity, there were extremists. In Islam, there were extremists. There were groups in Judaism that condemned other groups of Jews. There were groups within Christianity that they condemned other Christians. And not just in the Abrahamic faiths, the people of the book, all other faiths. We, re we recently saw, even among Buddhists, Buddhists who have the image of being peaceful people, you know, to the point that they're vegetarians, they're not even willing to harm animals, but we saw what happened in Myanmar with the Rohingya Muslims. Catastrophes, genocide that was taking place in uh, these supposedly peaceful areas. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Quran tells us that Jews and Christians condemned one another. Jews would say that Christians are not on the right path. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَى عَلَى شَيْءٍ And Christians would tell Jews that you are not on the right path. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ While reading their books, meaning they're religious. But this is the ignorant form of rhetoric. And the Quran says that you Muslims, you will fall in the same traps. Those who are ignorant will say the same thing that Jews said regarding Christians. And will say the same thing that Christians said regarding Jews. That you're not on the right path. This takfiri mentality, it existed from before Islam, from before the revelation of the Quran, to condemn the other, not to understand the other, but to condemn, condemning them to hell. It's as if they have a monopoly over heaven, that Allah created heaven only for them, and everyone else is going to hellfire. In the past decades, we witnessed several takfiri groups that ruled and plundered and killed and performed genocide and massacres, including Al-Qaeda, which, which existed in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and more recently, ISIS. What these groups all have in common is that they're what? Takfiri groups. They all believe in takfir, condemning the other. They are the only ones on the right path, Heaven is exclusive for them, and everyone else is condemned. Muslims, let alone other groups, let alone other religions. No, within Islam, we're speaking of within the framework of Islam. Shia are kuffar, Sufis are kuffar, everyone else is a kafir, except them, the Salafi school of thought. Now, ISIS might be eradicated on the battleground in Iraq. Alhamdulillah, in the past several months, we witnessed an eradication of ISIS on the battleground. But does that mean that we have eradicated their mentality and their thought? Of course not. 
That will take years. To get rid of an enemy on the battleground might not take a while. But to get rid of the enemy's mentality and way of thinking, this requires much effort. This requires a lot of work. It's worth mentioning, we have to be fair and honest, that there are some Shia that also believe in takfiri thought. There are some Shia that are quick into condemning. Not just quick in condemning, for example, their Sunni brothers and sisters. No. We have some Shia that condemn other Shia as well. Shia condemning other Shia. Why? Because they disagree over certain rituals or over following various maraji' or over certain theories, maybe political theories. Disagreement, which is something very legitimate and allowed in Islam. Because of these disagreements, they condemn one another. They label each other as non-Shia. You're, you're outside of the school of thought. So don't think that takfiri mentality, we are immune from takfiri mentality. It only exists in the Salafi and Wahhabi school of thought. No. In Shia school of thought, there are some that also have a mentality, a takfiri mentality. Unfortunately, there are some countries in which takfir is taught at a young age. At a young age. From, it exists within the school curriculum. In some countries, I, don't, I will not mention names. In the school curriculum, young children are taught that if you visit graves, ziyaratul quburi shirkun. To visit graves is a form of shirk. So that means if you visit the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, this is shirk. If you visit the Baqi' this is shirk. If you visit Karbala and Najaf and Baghdad and Samarra, this is shirk. So what does that make Shia? Mushrikeen. That makes Shia Mushrikeen. Young school children are taught with this sort of mentality. So the, the, the problem is very deep and it's very dangerous. What I'd like to talk about today, my dear brothers and sisters, is regarding three points. Number one, how did extremism infiltrate our schools of thought? How did extremism come into Islam and brainwash the minds of thousands of young men and women? How did this happen? What are the causes of takfir? This is one. Number two, what are the signs of an extremist? How can you tell if this person is an extremist and that person is not an extremist. What are the signs? And number three, what steps can we take to put an end to extremist mentality and takfiri mentality? Of course, our job is not to fight on the battleground. There are some that are doing so in Iraq and who bravely fought ISIS. Some were victorious, some lost their lives in this cause this noble cause to fight ISIS, to fight these barbarians. They did their job. Now what is my job and what is your job? Our job is maybe not to enter the battlefield and fight, but we have our own fight. We have another fight. How can we help eradicate takfiri mentality? That will be my third point. Wa sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So first of all, what are the causes of extremism? How did takfiri thought infiltrate our system? Well, first of all, we have to be honest. We have part of our literature, Islamic literature. We have certain ahadith that promote takfiri thought. Yes, it, rely, it, it exists in our books, in our literature, not just Sunni books but even Shia books. And I'd like to mention one example. During Muharram, the past Muharram, I gave an entire lecture on this topic when I was in New Zealand. The hadith of Al-Firqatu Najiyah, the saved sect in Islam. There's a theory among both Sunnis and Shias that there is one saved sect in Islam, Al-Firqatu Najiyah, the hadith, in its various versions, there is various versions to the hadith. Basically, it says that Jews 
were divided into 71 groups, one of them will go to heaven and 70 groups will go to hell. Christians were divided into 72 groups. Only one group will go to heaven, 71 groups will go to hellfire. And you Muslims, supposedly Rasulullah is stating this, you Muslims will be divided into 73 groups. One of you will only go to heaven and the rest will go to hellfire. Now I give an entire lecture on this, uh, this hadith and I analyzed it and I reached the conclusion that this hadith is unacceptable for many reasons. One is the Sanad, the chain of narrators in both the Shi'i version and the Sunni version. Refer to the lecture and see. It has a weak isnad. It has a weak chain of narrators. This is one. Two, the hadith does not make sense. Does it make sense? How can one sect, one sect, even if they are evildoers, even if they are murderers and rapists, and they all go to heaven, and summon to two sects where people, some of them could be innocent people. They could be ignorant. They could be, you know, not capable of reaching the truth. They all go to hellfire. This doesn't make sense. Number three, where did the mercy of Allah go? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created heaven for only a small minority and hellfire for the majority. Then where did the mercy of Allah go? So this hadith is very problematic. And there were brave scholars to come out and say that this hadith is unreliable. And acceptable. This hadith is the base, one of the basis of takfir. Look at ISIS. Look at Al Qaeda. When they condemn others, one of the first proof that they mention, Hadith al Firqat al Najiyah. And on our side as well, from Shi'i scholars, you see some Shi'i groups, as soon as they want to condemn others, they mention Hadith al Firqat al Najiyah. And what's funny is that each school of thought claims to be what? Al Firqatul Najiyah, the safe sect. Every group they claim to be the safe sect. In Sunni Islam, the Shafi'is they claim to be the safe sect. The Hanbalis they claim to be the safe sect. The Hanafis, the Malikis. When we come to the Shia, when we come to Sufis, everyone claims to be the safe sect in Islam. So first of all, our literature, our Islamic literature, some of our hadith they promote takfir. We have to reevaluate these ahadith. We have to come and restudy. Do these ahadith really, can we accept them? Do they conform to the Quran? Because any hadith that does not conform to the Quran, فَضْرُبُوهُ عَرْضُ الْجِدَارِ This is, the Ahl al-Bayt say this, that any hadith that does not conform to the Quran or conflicts with the Quran, throw it against the wall. Throw it away. Don't attribute it to the Ahl al-Bayt. So this is one of the problems. Another problem, my dear friends, is ignorance. Imam Ali says, people are fearful of that which they don't know. When you're living in a, in a village somewhere in, I don't know, I won't mention names of countries, and you follow a certain school of thought, and you hear, for example, about Shias, you've never met a Shia in your life. You don't know anything about Shi'ism. And the Imam of your mosque, he tells you Shi'as are kuffar, they're mushrikeen, they're this, they're that. Obviously, you're going to develop a, a negative image of Shia. You're going to think they're kuffar. You know, believe it or not, in some countries, they would spread rumors about Shia that Shia have tails. Tails, like animals. There are some, in, in some countries, they believed in this. The Shia have tales. I've heard many stories where Shia traveled to certain countries and they met people and they were asked, do you have tales? Can you show us your tale? This is ridiculous. What is this, uh, a movie made in Hollywood? This is due to ignorance, due to seclusion. Lack of dialogue. When you haven't met someone from the other school of thought, from another religion, from another faith, you're going to fear them. You're going to buy into these stereotypes. 
and misconceptions. What we need is dialogue between the various schools of thought. We need to communicate between one another, understand one another, because ignorance leads to takfir. Extreme piety, without knowledge, without wisdom, without understanding, leads to what? Leads to radicalism and extremism and takfir. When these two things mix, extreme piety, extreme religiosity, but with ignorance. That is why Islam emphasizes on knowledge, on wisdom, on understanding, to read and learn. Because faith in itself is not enough. Having piety in itself is not enough. Look at the Khawarij. The Khawarij were pious. They would pray. Imam Ali السلام, he sent Ibn Abbas to see the Khawarij. He came back, he said, Ya Mir al -Mumleen. I saw them praying, fasting. Their foreheads, they had marks of sujood. They would worship, but they were what? Ignorant. That is why they assassinated Abdurrahman ibn Muljam. He was a Khariji. He was among the Khawarij. Why did he assassinate Amir al muminin on the 19th of Ramadan? Why? Because the 19th of Ramadan could possibly be what? Laylatul Qadr. And on Laylatul Qadr, our deeds are multiplied by a thousand. So he wanted, to, he wanted to assassinate Imam Ali on Laylatul Qadr so that the reward will be multiplied by a thousand. Think about that for a minute. He thought that killing, assassinating Imam Ali is a ibadah. It's a form of worship. He wanted to be rewarded. This is extreme piety, but without knowledge. This is what it leads to. You know, these fighters in ISIS, they come and they blow themselves up. They're religious. They're doing this for the sake of Allah. They're not doing this for money. But they're ignorant. They have no knowledge. They haven't used this gift that Allah SWT has given them. You come and you blow yourselves up next to a school, next to innocent people that haven't harmed anyone, either in Iraq or France, in Nice, France. There's people that are tourists. They haven't harmed anyone. You come and drive a car in the middle of these innocent people. What sort of ignorance is this? So this is a problem. And a bigger problem is that there are religious figures that cater to these ignorant people. Instead of coming to educate them, they come and emphasize their ignorance. And so, instead of educating them and t teaching them that takfir is not part of Islam, they come and emphasize on takfir. And they add fuel to the fire. And they use sectarian language with the takfiri language. Why? Because these are the masses. They want to be popular among the masses. This is a problem. We have religious figures that add fuel to the fire. Instead of educating, they add to the takfir. They are influenced by the masses, while it should be the other way around. The scholars should be influencing the masses, not the masses influencing the scholars. This is a problem that we have. There are some scholars from both schools of thought. They add. They promote takfir. We, from the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, we also have some scholars. They speak, perhaps they say the truth, but not at the right time. You know, it takes a wise person to, they, to say the right thing at the right time. Your timing has to be right. You can't come and say whatever you'd like in front of the masses, in front of the public, and expect everything to be fine. No, this is not wise. There are certain, certain things that cannot be said or should be reserved at specific times for specific audiences. We also have this problem. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Another cause for takfir is insecurity. There are some out of fear for their school of thought. For example, they see their youth, they're becoming Shia. Right? Their youth are becoming Shia. Out of fear for their youth, 
They begin using aggressive ways. They begin to curse the Shia, condemn the Shia, say that the Shia are condemned to hellfire out of insecurity, out of fear for their faith, out of fear of losing their followers. They resort to aggressive ways. And this is not the right way. If you want to attract followers, you don't go through takfir. You use wisdom. You use the right language. You attract followers by presenting your school of, thought, school of thought in the right way. Don't think that you can attract followers by condemning other schools of thought. Or within Shia Islam, by condemning certain maraja or certain scholars to make yourself look good. That, that, doesn't look that it doesn't work that way. If you want to look good, present yourself in a, in a good fashion. You don't have to condemn others. And what has added fuel to the fire? Certain Western countries. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. But when it comes to this, yes, there are some countries with agendas to divide Muslims. They enjoy to see Shias and Sunnis killing one another. It serves their interests. Divide and conquer. What is better than to have Sunnis and Shias fight each other so that they will be divided? You can easily come and divide them. Yes, there are some imperialistic powers that have that have an agenda. Proof of that is that we see certain groups, they, they walk freely, they live freely in certain Western countries, takfiri groups in Western countries. Why aren't these people you know, being locked down? Why are their mosques running freely? They're able to preach their takfiri rhetoric completely free in certain Western countries. If they were true in fighting takfir, begin by shutting down certain mosques that promote takfir, sponsored by countries in the Middle East. This is one group that added fuel to the fire. And two, there are certain satellite channels that have also added fuel to the fire, that spread sectarian tones, that condemn from morning till night. Watch their channels. They condemn this group and that group. They curse this group. They curse this individual and that individual. Not just from other schools of thought, from their own schools of thought. They condemn this merja and that merja and this scholar and this scholar. They're serving the interests of others. There are some Shi'i groups that work against other Shi'a more than Wahhabis themselves. If Wahhabis wanted to work against the Shia, they wouldn't be able to, like some Shi'i groups, unfortunately. This is sectarian language. This is takfiri mentality. This is what is destroying us. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah. Now, how can you tell an extremist from an non-extremist? Perhaps we too are extremists. How can we tell? What are the signs of an extremist? Number one, an extremist makes a big deal from small things. A small matter, they make them into a big matter. This is the sign of an extremist. Something that it could be important, but it's not the most important matter to believe in. Right? For example, certain practices. If you don't practice this, you're not a Shi'i, or you're not a believer, or you're not a Muslim. It's a practice. Or a certain theory. If you don't accept this theory, you're not a Muslim, or you're not a Shi'i. This is wrong. It's a theory. You could accept it, you could reject it. It's a ritual. It's a practice. You could accept it, you could not accept it. It's a minor issue, but made into an issue that leads to salvation. If you practice this ritual, you go to heaven. If you stand against this ritual, you go to hellfire. Hold on a minute. Who are you to decide? Who are you to decide that this ritual 
takes you to heaven, and if you don't accept this ritual, you go to hellfire. During the days of Bani al-Abbas, during the days of al-Ma'mun, there was a fitna called Mihnat Khalq al-Qur'an. There was a major debate among scholars that is the Qur'an created or not created? You know, this mihna, this problem, it led to bloodshed, to murder, to killing. Several scholars were jailed because of this issue. Ahmad ibn Hanbal was jailed. He was beaten because he had an opinion. It's a theoretical question. Is the Qur'an created or not created? It's a minor issue, but blown up to the point that you're either a Muslim or a non-Muslim, depending on which side you choose. Today we see the same. There are some individuals, they believe in certain rituals, and they make this ritual a hallmark. It's at the entrance of the heaven. If you believe in this ritual, you go to heaven. If you don't believe, you're going to hellfire. Who told you this? In which book did you find this? So this is a sign of extremism. Making small things into big matters. This is one. Two, a sign of extremism is when you begin to harass others for religious views. You ridicule others for religious views. You name call others for religious views. If you do this, this is a sign of extremism. When it comes to religion, you can't ridicule anyone. People are entitled to their opinions. Who are you to come and enforce your opinions on others? Allah Azza wa Jal tells Rasulullah that you cannot enforce your opinions on others. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ طَاهَا مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنِ لِتَشْقَى Rasulullah tried his best to guide certain individuals. Allah tells them, no. You, you say your message and you leave the rest for Allah. Don't try to enforce. You see some individuals, if you don't believe in what they believe in, if you don't accept their opinions, they ridicule you. They name call you. And alhamdulillah today there's warriors on Twitter and Facebook and on Instagram. They're sitting, waiting for you to say anything that doesn't go against, that goes against what they believe in. And immediately the war begins. These are cowards. These individuals, they're cowards. Because if, if they're brave enough, they come to your face and they tell you, but they don't come to your face. They go behind the screen on Twitter and on Facebook and they begin to attack you. Calm down. Relax. This is the faith of Allah. This is the religion of Allah. Who are you to come and enforce your opinions on others? لا إكراه في الدين well, I, I believe in this and that, and I want to enforce. And if you don't accept me, you're not a Shi'i. Who are you to decide who is a Shi'i and who is not a Shi'i? Who are you to decide who is a Muslim and not a Muslim? So this is another sign. Another sign is stopping at the words of the Salaf, the elders, the previous generations. What the Salaf, what the previous scholars stated, we stop there. No ijtihad, there's no room for reinterpretation, there's no room for reevaluation, there's no room for rereading. No, what the previous scholars said, we take for granted, we take for face value. No, this doesn't exist in Islam. There's ijtihad. Former scholars, we respect them, but they had their opinions. Today we have new scholars. The door of ijtihad is open. The door of reinterpreting is always open. The Quran is meant to be applied at all times and various times, and the Quran could be understood better by later generations. رب حامل فقه وليس وليس بفقيه ورب حامل فقه إلى من هو أفقه من. The Hadith says sometimes you carry knowledge. To someone who is more knowledgeable than you. I might say a hadith now and I give it to you. You can understand the hadith better than me. Although you heard the hadith from me. But you might understand it better than me. 
We don't need to stop at the words of the Salaf. We have respect for them. But there's always room for re-evaluation, reinterpretation. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So how can we put an end to takfir, my dear brothers and sisters? How can we promote understanding? First of all, we have to understand that who are we to condemn others? The Quran condemns condemning. See? It condemns condemning. كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ The Quran tells us that Jews condemned Christians and Christians condemned Jews and then he said some people that are ignorant will do the same. You Muslims, some of you will do the same. You will perform takfir, condemning one another, condemning each other to hellfire. No. Saying the shahadatain is enough to be considered a Muslim. Saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. This is enough. You consider this person a Muslim. His blood becomes haram. He becomes tahir. You can eat his food. You can marry this person. That's it. This person is considered a Muslim. Who are you to come and say this person is not a Muslim? In fact, look at the Quran. Look how beautiful. The Quran even considers hypocrites as Muslims. Even hypocrites. Ajib. You might say where? I'll tell you. وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا The Arab, the Bedouins, they said, we believe. The Quran says, no, don't say we believe. We don't know. Perhaps you could be hypocrites. But say, we have become Muslim. Even the Arab who could be hypocrites, the Quran says, you're Muslim. But you're not necessarily a believer. Because not every Muslim is a believer. Right? But they're Muslim. Even these hypocrites, the Quran calls them Muslim. Jurists tell us that if you find a child abandoned by his parents in an Islamic country that has, non that has a non-Muslim population and you doubt whether this child is a Muslim or a non-Muslim, you should consider this child what? A Muslim. In fact, Jews say even in a non-Muslim country, if you find a lost child, for example, here in, here in Waterdam, here in the Netherlands, you find a child, a baby, abandoned by his parents. And you don't know whether this child is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. But there are some Muslims living in that city and there's a chance you could be Muslim. You consider this child what? A Muslim. You see how our laws are so convenient? They are so encompassing and inclusive. Islam teaches us to be inclusive, to consider people Muslim. You have some that want to condemn. This person is a mushrik, this person is a kafir, this person is a betri, this person is a non shi'id. Who are you to come and decide? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with Abdullah ibn Ubay, the head of munafiqeen, the head of the hypocrites, on his deathbed, he asked Rasulullah to come and pray for him. Rasulullah went and prayed for him. The head of the hypocrites. He went and he prayed for him. And then he had a request from Rasulullah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, give me your shirt. I want to be buried in your shirt. Abdullah ibn Ubay was fighting Rasulullah. He was the head of the hypocrites. Ya Rasulullah, he gave him his shirt to be covered with his shirt to be, and to be buried in his shirt. Does it get better than this? Do we see more mercy than the mercy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The khawarij who were the first takfiris in Islam, the first to condemn others in Islam. They condemned Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa. They considered him a kafir. They condemned Imam Ali alayhi salam, and they considered him a kafir. Why? Because he accepted the rule of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari during the arbitration between the camp of Muawiyah and the army of Imam Ali in the battle of 
Safin. There was an arbitration, Tahkim, Abu Musa al Ash'ari and Amr ibn al As. They gathered and they decided to remove both Imam Ali and Muawiyah. Of course, there was a trap for Abu Musa al Ash'ari. Abu Musa al Ash'ari removed Imam Ali from, from power. And there was a ceasefire. The Khawarij, they wanted the ceasefire. Now that Imam Ali accepted the ceasefire, they told him, no, we have to fight Muawiyah. Imam Ali said, no. Now that I've accepted a ceasefire, I will no longer fight. They told him that you're, you're a kafir. You're a kafir. But look on the other hand, Imam Ali, السلام, he was asked about the Khawarij. He was asked, are they kuffar? He said, no. Are they mushrikeen? He said, no. Ahum kuffar? Qala la. Bal hum min al kufri farru. They are not kuffar. They ran away from kufr. Then they, what are they, ya amir al mu'minin? Tell us, what are the khawarij? He said, ikhwanuna baghaw alayna. Our brothers who turned against us. Our brothers who turned against us. He didn't say kuffar. He didn't say mushrikeen. He didn't say non-believers. No, no. Our brothers returned against us. And today we see the same sort of mentality in the followers of Ahlul Bayt, in the true followers of Ahlul Bayt. Not everyone that claims to be a follower of Ahlul Bayt is genuinely following their footsteps and their teachings. Look at Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani in Iraq. In the early days, of the fall of Saddam until today. Look at, how, look at how he's been inclusive to all Iraqis, to all Muslims. He was asked about Sunnis, Sunni Muslims. He, fayed, he said his famous quote, لا تقولوا إخواننا قولوا أنفسنا Do not say they are our brothers. Say they are ourselves. This is the top merja in Shia Islam. This is the sort of mentality that that he has. This is the beautiful mentality that the mentality of Ahlul Bayt that we should all be following. My dear friends, Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. There is a need for dialogue. I believe that one of the best ways to end takfiri mentality is to engage one another. Have a dialogue with one another. We begin from city to city. You begin here in Waterdam. You go and you visit Sunni mosques. You take them gifts. You take them flowers. You go as a group. And then you invite them to your mosque. And you have monthly visits, bi-monthly visits. You visit them as much as you can. This is the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Zuru nardahum. Ihdaru janaizahum. Ishadu lahum wa alayhim. إن فعلت ذلك قالوا رحم الله جعفر بن محمد ما أحسن ما كان يؤدب أصحابه وإن تركت ذلك قالوا فعل الله كذا وكذا بجعفر بن محمد ما كان أسوأ ما يؤدب أصحابه ما مصادق تزوز companions go and visit them visit who visit your Sunni brothers and sisters go visit their sick go attend their جنائز if they have a funeral go and attend Go visit them. Let them visit you. If they want you to come and testify in court, go and testify in court. If you do that, they will say, May Allah bless Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. Look at how he disciplined his companions. When you don't do this, they will say, May Allah do such and such with Ja'far ibn Muhammad because he did not discipline his companions. Imam al-Sadiq has been telling us this over 14 centuries ago. And where are we? We're sleeping. Do we have dialogue with our Sunni brothers and sisters? Do they have dialogue with us? Today, we cannot afford to live in seclusion. After the crisis of ISIS, we can no longer afford another war. We can no longer afford more bloodshed and more killing in the name of Islam. You know, there are some Muslims, I'm surprised, they are willing to have Muslim-Christian dialogue. Muslim Christian dialogue. Recently, the Pope visited Al Azhar and he met with Al Sheikh Al Azhar. Sunni, a top Sunni leader with a top Christian leader. But when it comes to Muslim Muslim dialogue, they're not willing. Sunni Shi'i dialogue, they're not willing. Why? 
You're willing to, to meet with other faiths and other religions, but you're not willing to meet with followers of your own religion? What a shame. We need a Muslim Christian dialogue and we need a Sunni Shi'i dialogue. And we need one more dialogue. A what? A Shi'i Shi'i dialogue. Do you agree? Because we Shia were disunited. We condemn one another. We are name calling one another. We are ridiculing one another. We also need a Shi'i Shi'i dialogue. You know, in Christianity, there were battles and wars between Christians and Catholics. These European nations here, here in, in Europe, these countries, they fought and they battled one another just within the past century during World War I, World War II. But look at them now. They formed the European Union and they've united. Christians have united. They work peacefully with each other. Although they had a bad, bad history, bad past, why can't we do the same? Why can't we Muslims do the same, get over our past and unite? And there's one more thing, that we have to respect disagreement. Unfortunately, there are some that do not respect the other opinion. It is only their opinion that counts and no other, no other opinion counts. Why? The Quran encourages freedom of thought. And naturally, when you think, does everyone reach the same conclusions and same opinions? Of course not. When the Quran invites us to think and to ponder, that means it is legitimizing various opinions that each person is entitled to their opinion. In fact, let me take it a step further. One of the reasons why Allah Azza wa Jal has created us is to disagree. Is to disagree with one another. Where? I'll tell you in the Quran. وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ They disagree. Humans disagree. And then the verse that says, وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ Allah created humans to disagree. Allah created humans to have various opinions and to disagree. It's okay to disagree. فَبَشَّرْ عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ The best people are those that listen to various opinions and they choose the best. Listen! There are some people that are not, that are not even willing to listen to other opinions. What a mistake. These people are not following the culture of the Qur'an. They're closed-minded, opinionated, judgmental, Unfortunately. And one of the most dangerous results of extremism, you know, extremists, takfiris, usually their motive is to protect religion and faith. If you ask ISIS members, why do you blow yourselves up and you kill and you fight and you condemn? They say to protect Islam. All takfiris, anyone with a takfiri sort of mentality, if you ask them, why do you do this? They say, I'm protecting my faith. I'm protecting my religion. These people, what they're doing is they're driving people away from Islam. They have the complete opposite effect. How many people abandoned Islam because of takfiri mentality? They say, look, if Islam equals ISIS, then I don't want to have anything to do with Islam. If Islam is about killing people and chopping off their heads and blowing themselves, then this is not the Islam that I want. So extremism builds the opposite effect. When you're an extremist, you're trying to call people to Islam, the exact opposite effect occurs. You're drawing people away from Islam. You're making them hate Islam. Okay. So, understanding is important. Dialogue is important. Opening to one another is important. These are all important things, my dear brothers and sisters. And if we don't, then takfiri mentality will continue in our communities.
Takfir is not a new phenomenon, my dear friends. Don't think that it started recently or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. No, Takfir started 14 centuries ago. From the, the, from the day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam passed away, the Takfiri mentality started. How was Imam Hussein killed? Under what excuse? Didn't they call him a Khariji? Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his companions. They were called Khawarij. Yazid had given an order to the governor of Medina. He said, I want you to bring Al Hussein ibn Ali, even if you see him holding on to the Kaaba, to the cloth of the Kaaba. What does this mean? He was basically saying that Imam Hussein is a Kafir, he's a Khariji, and that's why we should kill him. They spread the news that the people that were killed in Karbala, they were Khawarij. They deserved it because they had rose against the Imam of their time and they're not Muslim. You see, takfir existed from those days. And Imam Hussein was one of the early victims of takfir. And who else was a victim of takfir? Fatima al Zahra. Let's ask ourselves under what excuse was the house of Fatima al Zahra was ambushed and attacked? Fatima al Zahra was at her house was attacked. She was physically abused. Her, her husband was dragged out of the house. Fatima al Zahra, why was she hiding behind the door? Have you asked why? Because she wasn't wearing hijab. She was covering herself. So that's why she was behind the door. Under what justification did they enter the house of Fatima al Zahra? Is it not that they believed in takfir? That if you don't give allegiance to the Khalifa, you're not a Muslim? Hurub al Ridda, Malik ibn Nuwayra. Why was Malik ibn Nuwayra murdered by Khalid ibn al Walid under the guidance, under the leadership of the first Khalifa? Malik ibn Nuwayra was a companion of Imam Ali, and he refused to give zakat to this Khalifa. He said, this is not the Khalifa that Rasulullah appointed. The Khalifa that I know of, that Rasulullah appointed was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He refused to give his zakat. Khalid ibn al-Walid came. He saw his wife. As soon as he saw his wife, he said, I will, I will kill you. And he killed him. And then he cooked a pot. He created fire. And he put the head of Malik ibn Nuwayra under the pot. And he cooked food. Same thing that ISIS did in Iraq and in Syria. Same mentality, same actions. And they say, no, have respect for Khalid, Khalid ibn al-Walid. He was a companion of Rasulullah. I tell you, Khalid ibn al-Walid was among the first founders of ISIS. With this sort of actions. So takfir existed from the early days. Now let's come to the house of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. On days like this, Fatima al-Zahra had passed away and she had given her will to Imam Ali that when you bury me, you bury me at night. You wash my body at night and you bury me at night. And I don't want any one of these, of my enemies to attend my burial. Indeed, when the news of the death of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam spread, the companions gathered at the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen asking what is the time of the janazah, Salat al-Janazah. What is the time of the burial? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he told his son, Imam al-Hassan, to tell them that the burial has been postponed for tomorrow. That night everyone went to sleep. Imam Ali alayhi salam woke up in the middle of the night. Although I doubt Imam Ali had slept for those nights. 
He got up at night. He called Fadla and Asma. It was time to wash the body of Fatima al Zahra. Imam Ali alayhi salam put the body of Fatima al Zahra on Al Muqtasal where you wash the body. Asma bint Umais would help Imam Ali wash the body of Fatima. As he, wash, as he was washing the body, Asma bint Umais all of a sudden saw Imam Ali, his tears started flowing on his cheeks. She asked him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, did you see anything? He said, Ya Asma, I saw the broken ribs of Fatima. As I was washing her body, I saw the broken ribs. Ya Asma, Fatima never told me about her broken ribs. When he finished the ghost, when he finished the kafan, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he called his children to come and say farewell for one last, last time to their mother Fatima. Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, Ya Zainab, Ya Umma Kulthum, Halummu wa waddu'u ummakum Fatima. Come, my dear children, Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, and Umma Kulthum. Come and say farewell to your mother, Fatima. The narration says that they all gathered around her body. They threw themselves on the body of the mother, Fatima. They're hugging her, kissing her. Imam Ali says, Ashhadu billah annaha hannat wa annat wa akhrajat yadayha wa dhammathuma ila sadriha. Imam Ali says, I swear to God that I heard Fatima crying and she took out her hands from the kiffin and she hugged her children. It was in the middle of the night. Imam Ali alayhi salam in the peaceful night, in the dark night, along with Ammar, Salman, Miqdad, and only a handful of the companions, they gather in the body of Fatima to that grave, to that lonely grave that to this day we don't know where it is. They went to the grave Imam Ali alayhi salam he went to the grave by himself he entered the grave he held the body of Fatima and he buried her when he got out of, out of the grave he poured the soil all of a sudden he felt imme immense sadness but who can he complain to Imam Ali looked towards the grave of Rasulullah Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah Anni wa an ibnatika nazilati fi juwarik Peace be upon you ya, uh, ya Rasulullah On my behalf and on the behalf of your daughter Who has come to meet you tonight ya Rasulullah قل عن صفيتك صبري يا رسول الله لقد استرجعت الوديعة يا رسول الله you had entrusted me with your daughter on the day of their wedding رسول الله had grabbed the hand of Fatima and he grabbed the hand of Imam Ali he put the hand of Fatima in the hand of Amir al-Mu'mineen he said Ya Ali hadhi wadi'ati andak Ya Ali I am trusting you with my daughter take care of her Ya Rasulullah I am returning this amana that you had entrusted me with but Ya Rasulullah I am embarrassed of you 
Fatima is returning with broken ribs. Fastakhbirah al-hal. Ask her, Ya Rasulullah, what this ummah did to her and to me. And she will tell you, فَكَمْ مِنْ غَلِيلٍ مُعْتَلِجٍ فِي صَدْرِهَا لَمْ تَجِدْ لَهُ, له مِنْ بَثِّهِ سَبِيلًا And you will say that there was so pain, so much pain and agony in the heart and the chest of Fatima that she did not speak. Amir al Mu'mineen came back to the house along with his orphans, Al Hassan, Wal Hussein, and Zainab, quieting these orphans coming back to the house without the mother in any house the mother is the light of the house the mother is the jewel of the house when the mother is missing in the house the the house has no spirit imam ali came back to the house but fatima zahra is missing quieting his children imam ali entered the house he saw the door and he saw the needle. He put his forehead on the door and he began to weep, remembering the tragedy of Fatima al-Zahra. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-Ali al-Azim. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون. Raise your hands in dua. Several people have asked us for dua. People that have messaged me and asked for dua. Those that are ill, those that are that have hajat. This is the blessing majlis of Fatima al Zahra. Inshallah, Allah will not turn us down and accept our dua. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العلي الأعظم. ألا عز الأجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا خوفا إلا آمنته ولا رزقا إلا بسطته ولا شملا إلا جمعته ولا مرضا إلا شفيته ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء نقرأ سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات